testimony. Thank you. Is there anyone in the room who has a differing opinion? Sir, would you come forward and state your name for the record? Not that, not that we're looking for yeas and nays, but it would be nice to have divergence of opinion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Fred Birnbaum. I'm with the Idaho Freedom Foundation. And I'd like to speak in opposition both to Senate bills 1204 and 1205. I know they're slightly different, but a lot of the points that I'd like to bring up are the same. I guess I'm going to work from the back forward. And one of the things that was pointed out about Senate Bill 1205 was that if the federal government, in its wisdom, decided to change its contribution from what is projected to be uh, lowered to 90 percent, that Idaho could opt out of this Medicaid expansion. Mr. Chairman and members of this committee, I'd like to ask you to think back to last year when Idaho appeared, or at least uh, initiated some pushback on the child support legislation, and the federal government, among many other things, threatened the TANF funds to the state. And I've spoken to a couple of attorneys, and they actually would tell you for the record that the Supreme Court decision in NFIB versus Sebelius would suggest that states didn't have to expand Medicaid. But once they did, it would be up to the Secretary of Health and Human Services under 1396 of the Social Security Act to determine if a state was complying. Put simply, if a state expanded its definition of the population, even if the FMAP was lower to 90 or lower, it couldn't withdraw without threatening all federal Medicaid dollars. I might remind everyone that the federal government last year when we talked about this was 18 trillion in debt. It's now just past 19 trillion. And I think it's presumptuous to assume that the federal government can maintain a 90-10 FMAP. Forever. It just doesn't seem reasonable to me. I bring that up because the cost saving scenarios that have been outlined today are predicated on a better than 90% FMAP. In fact, if you look at the statement of purpose of one of the bills, it says 98%. And I realize the federal government would start in potentially at 100 and go down. But there's no way the current administration, which will be gone in a year, can compel future Congresses to fund it at that rate. So the savings that are projected are based on thin air, in my opinion, because we simply don't know what future Congresses would do when they consider how they're going to tackle, which next year will be close to a $20 trillion debt. So I don't think we should base doing this on cost savings, because I just don't think that's a, a realistic scenario. If you look at the total scope of Medicaid since it was first initiated, it hasn't shown very good cost control. I would mention a couple of other things. Of the 17 states that have publicly shared enrollment data, every one of them has surpassed projected enrollment by an average of 91%. States like Ohio recently ran $1.5 billion over its budget for Medicaid expansion in the first 18 months. Washington had to increase its buy-in and budget by $2.3 billion. So these costs that have come in based on higher than projected enrollment numbers doom the notion that this is going to save money. So I, I think it's very important to point that out. I'll also mention that in Congress, Congressman Westerman of Arkansas has already filed a bill to reset the matching rate to the traditional formula, which is 70-30 in Idaho, for example. So while we can talk about how it might be, I think it's very important when you look at the overarching issues here, which is the lack of uh, federal government's ability to contain costs that has very high debt, the fact that the matching rate traditionally is 70-30, that the FMAP has already changed up and down. I don't think we can assume that this is going to save the state money. I do want to close with one point. There was a, a doctor came up and he made a very, well, I thought, serious charge that essentially those opposed to this are sort of responsible for killing people, and, and I think that's not fair. 
He pointed to a, and I'm not a doctor, I know that, he pointed to a New England Journal of Medicine study, but there was also a study in Oregon that, that said the opposite, which was Medicaid expansion didn't uh, improve health outcomes. And I'm sure there are a lot of studies that can be brought to the fore about how you improve health outcomes. And you know his claim that putting people on insurance, I'm sure there's some great anecdotal evidence that that is so. But I, I wouldn't conclude on the basis of one study that that is, in fact, the case. Uh, I thank you all, and I stand for questions. Okay. Senator Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you mentioned in your testimony that some of the states who have expanded have surpassed enrollment. Do you have any information as to what actuarial data that those states used and how they may have gone beyond that enrollment? or how they came to make their estimates in the first place? Fred, do you have that information? Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Jordan, I do not uh, have that. I have the data on the actual projections and the percent over. Thank you, but Mr. I Chairman. Don't, that wasn't my question. I don't. So, Mr. Chairman, Senator Jordan, I do not um, have that answer on the actuarial data. I have the numbers of projections and actuals, but not the methodology. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fred, for your testimony today. Uh, I don't know how to go about finding the people in the room, <laughs> both pro and con. Uh, so if you have a burning desire to testify, we'll take this lady in the front row, you two in the second row, and you in the, toward the rear. But So ma'am, if you'll come forward and State your name for the record. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. My name is Shelley Glue. Shelley? And I, yes. Sir. Okay. Welcome, I live in Shelley. The, thank you. I'm here to share my story today because, unfortunately, it is not a singular story. 78,000 Idahoans live in the Gap. It's a scary place. There is no dignity here. We scrape by as best we can, always looking for a way to work our wet selves out. Living in the Gap has dire consequences. We live in terror of illness and injury. One emergency can devastate us. We are often forced to choose between seeing a doctor, keeping the lights and heat on, or filling our gas tanks. We simply cannot afford our medical care. From the beginning, my family has been squeezed. My husband is chronically ill. He struggles with stomach pain so severe that he often cannot stand and vomits for hours, and sometimes it lasts for days. Dealing with this has been like trying to escape quicksand. My husband wants to work. And so when the pain gets severe, he seeks medical attention. But with only my income, the bills mounted quickly. Soon we owed tens of thousands of dollars. So we cobbled together a method to receive care. We utilize cheap care where and when we can find it. But mostly we ignore his problem until the pain is too much and he ends up in the ER. Whenever possible, we found doctors who would work with him. We were searching for hope to pull us out of this problem. It's been 10 years. We owe $60,000 in medical debt. But without answers, my husband cannot work. We are stuck tight in a terrible cycle. I can't breathe. I'm squeezed so tight. Despite the fact that I returned to college to find a better career with health benefits, I'm afraid we will never escape this pit. There are so many bills. I'm suffocating. My story is not unique. Most of my friends fall into the gap. We are waitresses, care providers, construction workers, adjunct faculty, store clerks. We are the people who keep Idaho running. But we live in the gap and are denied the most basic of medical care. And that is why I am so excited about the Healthy Idaho Plan. It requires that participants take responsibility for our own health while helping us out of the quicksand. With the Healthy Idaho Plan, the working poor will finally have some control over their lives. While I thank Governor Otter for his efforts, the PCAP leaves the working poor teetering on the brink of financial ruin by excluding emergency care. I ask you today to please consider the Healthy Idaho Plan so that the working poor can have some dignity and control over their own health and financial futures. We do not want to be the burdens that society perceives us to be. Give us a chance to show you what we can do with this opportunity. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Shelley. And for the record, did you say or spell your last name sorry g-l-u-c-h sir okay thank you very much
We appreciate your testimony. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, come forward. And ma'am, you can be next. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I introduced myself a couple days ago, so I'm going to try to get an extra we, we know you, Jim, and welcome 15 to the seconds committee. out of not doing the introductions again. I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. Um, this is uh, uh, something that we is desperately needed, and I'm very grateful that you were able to do this. Um, contrary to popular opinion, not all Idahoans with disabilities who live in poverty are eligible for Medicaid or Medicare. Um, or any other health insurance program. Um, so many low-income Idahoans with serious disabilities fall into this health insurance gap. I'll give you an example of some of the more identifiable populations. People with severe and persistent mental illness. Um, in Idaho, according to national statistics, there should be about 40,000 people. When I say severe and persistent, I'm not talking about someone who's had a bout with anxiety um, and, and, and takes a benzodiazepine. I'm talking about people who have severe symptoms, who have had repeated hospitalizations, and whose treatment is ongoing and uh, chronic. Of those 40,000 people, about 10,000 are currently eligible for Medicaid. About 10,000 more um, receive services through the Division of Behavioral Health using state general fund dollars. Those services are mostly available only to people who have reached a crisis in their lives such that they're a danger to themselves or others and that they're at a point where they could be involuntarily committed. They don't have community-based mental health services or preventive services. Um, there's another 20,000 out there who have this condition who in any given year uh, don't get into either of those treatment systems. Some of these people are in prison, some are in jail, some of them are homeless, um, some of them are simply um, out there experiencing symptoms but not seeking treatment. The single most important thing you can do to fix Idaho's very seriously, seriously stressed mental health system um, would be to adopt one of these two uh, programs. People with severe and persistent mental illness need more than primary care. They need specialty care, hospitalization, and they need coordinated care that um, mo much of which would not be covered by a primary care program such as the one pr uh, introduced by the governor. Not that everybody doesn't benefit from some primary care, but severe and persistent mental illness requires something more. Another large group of Idahoans with disabilities. When people acquire a disability and it becomes so severe that they can no longer work, whether it's a progressive condition like cancer or something else, they usually apply for Social Security disability benefits. If you can still work, you're not eligible for the benefits. So people have lost their job and uh, they no longer have coverage from their employer. When you get Social Security disability benefits, it depends on what your past earnings are, but if it's more than $734 a month, you're disqualified from Medicaid. You can't get Medicare for two years. The federal system has a waiting period so that people who qualify for disability benefits can't have Medicare for two years. At any given time, thousands of people in Idaho are in this Medicaid waiting period with a severe health condition and with no, uh, no insurance coverage. I don't know how many people are in that group because we don't have any way to actually track them, but what I can say is that Dr. Doug Damrose did his own little study on people who are accessing uh, county indigent care services. In his random sample, 42% of them were people who qualified for Social Security disability benefits but had no Medicare coverage yet. There are other people with disabilities who are in the insurance gap for a host Jim, of reasons. Jim, if I could yes. interrupt for just a moment, so that other people, as many as may have the opportunity, could have the opportunity, could you cut this short? Please? I would be happy to close. Um, what I want to say is that the people who are in the gap, we, have a, we often hear people say Medicaid covers people, covers children and women and people with disabilities who are poor. Well, it covers some people with disabilities who are poor. Tens of thousands of people with severe disabilities are not covered. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And if there's anyone in another room in the building who wishes to testify, uh, 
If you'd make your way down the hall, that would be appropriate, and we could hear you. We, we can have this young lady and then you, ma'am. Try to keep your comments to two or three minutes, please. Minutes. 